Hi, I'm Mickey Rosenthal from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you guys about a possible reason why super-Earths are all of a similar size, which is an observ observational signature, perhaps, of a limiting mass scale for pebble accretion. So pebble accretion, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a process of glowing planets that focuses on accretion of pebble-sized bodies as opposed to larger planetesimals. And here, the reason we're interested in pebbles is because they have properties such that they're marginally coupled to the gas flow. They're both large enough that they don't care, that they don't just follow the gas, and they're both not so big that they just don't care about the gas flow at all, and they're totally not affected by it. So what happens if you bring a pebble into a growing core that's been shown by a number of authors is that because the pebbles are of this marginal size, they can actually dissipate their energy during their interaction with the core and become gravitationally bound to the core during this encounter. And this can cause them to be bound on length scales that are much larger than you would expect for planetesimal accretion. In fact, what you can end up with in some cases is that cores can accrete pebbles over the entirety of their hill radii, which is in contrast to accretion of planetesimals, where usually the best you're going to do is impact parameters of about the geometric mean of the planet's radius and the hill radius. So one of the reasons that people were so interested in pebble accretion in the beginning is that it's fast. It solves a lot of the timescale issues that come along with planetesimal accretion. So just to give you guys an idea of some numbers, if you end up at core masses such that the hill velocity is larger than the local gas velocity, and by the hill velocity here I simply mean the orbit velocity at the core's hill radius, what you end up with, as I said before, are impact parameters that are of order the core's hill radius. There's a small reduction due to the size of the particle you're accreting, falling off like Stokes number to the one-third. I think we're all familiar with Stokes number, but if we're not, it's just a dimensionless measure of a particle size in terms of its coupling to the gas. So in terms of some fiducial values, what this means is that for a planet mass of greater than 10 to the negative 4 Earth masses, here this is scaled to 1 AU and a temperature prefactor of 200 Kelvin and an alpha value of 10 to the minus 3, what you end up with are growth rates that are about 4,000 years. Right? And this increases weekly with some major axis and also with the planet's mass. It falls off with the Stokes number and the size uh, and the amount of mass you have in pebbles. But it's a very, very rapid time scale. And so you can do a little bit better than this and be more careful with your calculation. So what I'm showing here is some results using some code I worked out with two papers I published with my advisor back in 2018, where I'm plotting the growth time scale of a core as a function of both planetary mass and the size of particle you're accreting. Right? The point I just want to stress here is, again, that this is just quick. I've been very more careful about the impact parameter and the size of the um, uh, scale height of pebbles. But over a wide range of parameter space, we get extremely rapid growth timescales, right? We're not getting less than sort of the disk lifetime of at 10 to the 6 years unless we're including pretty small particles at low core masses. And in particular, right, once we get to large sort of high mass cores up here, we're growing really, really quickly. So large cores can accrete pebbles and grow at extremely rapid rates. So one reason in particular this is very interesting is that we see a lot of planets right in this mass range. So this is a plot from this Fulton et al. paper that's looking at the sizes of Kepler planets, and we see this bimodal distribution, which is commonly interpreted as being a result of photoevaporation, right? And so that, what that would mean then is that these planets over here are sort of the bare core masses, and the, plant, and the uh, radii on the right are, have some gas envelopes, and so they have not been photoevaporated. But this is particularly intriguing because we've got a lot of cores right in the size where we expect pebble accretion to be extremely rapid. So how then can we slow this growth down? Well, there's a lot of different possibilities. One is we can just keep pebble sizes quite low. If you saw on the left-hand side of the plot that I showed before, right with low pebble sizes or just no pebbles, you don't grow very fast. There could be very inefficient accretion of solids. So that's something people sometimes appeal to, that pebbles tend to drift by cores instead of being accreted by them. You could also have pebble traps, as has already been talked about a little bit here. So you could have gas giants growing and trapping the inflow of pebbles, or other super Earth-class planets growing and trapping pebbles. And the last possibility is that at some mass range, the simple physics I've described sort of changes regimes, and instead some different physical effects come into play that changes qualitatively how this behavior proceeds. So it's that last sort of possibility that I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk. In particular, I want to look at this because I think there are two sort of observational effects that are coming in that might point to there being some limiting mass scale where pebble accretion changes. So the first is a result from Lauren Weiss et al. So what she and her collaborators did is they looked at the sizes of different Kepler planets or super-Earth planets in the same system, and what they found is that the sizes of these planets are strongly correlated with one another. Right? So they're just plotting here the size of one planet and the planet farther out within the same system, 
what they find, right, is that if you just plot a straight line along that, there's a strong correlation between the sizes of the two planets. This is exactly what we'd expect if there's some limited mass scale coming in here, and that mass scale is weakly dependent on the semi-major axis of the planets in your system. All right, and then a second result I want to point to is a recent result by Yan Chin Wu, where she looked at the effects of photoevaporation on the Kepler planets, right? So on the right here, we've got the radii of all of these planets for which there was also Gaia data available, plotted as a function of their orbital separation, and we see this bimodality here. Here all the radii have been of the planets have been scaled so that they're with the same sort of host star parameters. What she found is that if you just take planets at some characteristic mass scale of about Earth masses, and then you just let them photoevaporate or not, depending on where you put them in semi-major axis, what you end up with is what's shown on the right, which very nicely matches the sort of bimodality. So you can form all of these planets by just taking planets at a characteristic mass scale with some spread and just letting them photoevaporate, right? What she also found is that you have some particular scaling with um, solar mass, right? We're scaling with solar mass to somewhere, somewhere between linear and maybe beta to the 1.5, and we're scaling very weakly with semi-major axis here. Either no scaling whatsoever or maybe up to about the square root of the semi-major axis scaling. So this, to me, might be the effects of some pebble accretion mass scale that's coming in, since these planets could otherwise grow so rapidly by pebble accretion. So I'm going to talk about my favorite candidate for that, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't identify another possibility for this mass scale, which is what's called the pebble isolation mass. So this was first discussed by Lambrick, and, uh, Lambrick et al. in 2014, and there's also a very nice paper by Bertram Bisch and his collaborators looking at the pebble isolation mass and how that scales with the disk viscosity and the um, uh, power law of your pressure profile, but what they basically found is that once you get up to masses of about 20 Earth masses at 5 AU, the planet raises pressure bumps in your disk that actually excite the gas to be super Keplerian instead of sub Keplerian, and that stops this sort of inward drips of pebbles and actually repels them back outwards, right? And one thing that's quite interesting, as a few people pointed out, is this is quite similar in scale to the thermal mass. So the thermal mass is the scale at which the size of a core's hill radius is equal to the scale height of the gas in the disk, right? So if you plug those in and use the temperature profile that they used in that work, what you'll get is the same sort of mass scale with the same sort of scaling. Now, I will say that one reason we might be, think this thermal mass would be relevant here is because this is a commonly invoked mass scale to open up gas when we're talking about ga or gaps in gas when we're talking about gas giant planets. Bertrand Bisch sort of moved away from that interpretation in his work, saying that it was a different sort of scaling, different physical effects with, um, that led to similar sort of scalings, at least with semi-major axis. But I want to at least identify this mass scale here and come back to it, because it's going to show up in one second. So the other mass scale I want to talk about here came about when uh, Ruth and I were thinking about what would set the smallest particle sizes that can be accreted by pebble accretion. So the largest particle sizes that can be accreted are set by kinetic energy considerations. So to accrete a particle through pebble accretion, you need to have that particle dissipate its kinetic energy during this encounter, right? And so if the particle is too large, it will have too much kinetic energy, and it won't be able to dissipate that energy. But for the smallest sizes, what we looked at were instead what the flow pattern around some gravitating bodies looked like. So this is a simulation by Chris Ormel. And what's happening here is that on the scale of the planet's atmosphere, the gas is actually repelled and tends to flow around the protoplanet's atmosphere instead of penetrating inside of it. Now, this is quite a simple simulation. You can do more complicated things, like include the headwind or the shear velocity in the disk. But the overall picture sort of is still the same. On the scale of the planet's atmosphere, the gas tends to flow around it. Now, there's other more complicated things going on. So I know that there's been some work showing some recycling of the atmosphere, of the gas into the planet's atmosphere. I don't think that changes the overall picture I'm going to describe very much, but I'd be happy to chat about it offline if anyone's interested. But right on the scale of the core's atmosphere, these ga this gas tends to flow around it. And why that ties into pebble accretion is that the impact parameter for accretion in pebble accretion is strongly dependent on the size of particle you're accreting here. So what I'm showing here is a very cartoon picture of a core accreting two different sizes of particles. In green, we have a larger particle whose impact parameter is larger than the scale of the core's atmosphere. And then in red, we have a smaller particle whose impact parameter for accretion is inside the scale of the core's atmosphere. Right? So because the particle needs to dissipate its kinetic energy, what's going to happen to this red particle is it's going to come in and try to dissipate its kinetic energy relative to the core. But on this length scale, it's going to become coupled to the gas. So instead of being able to penetrate inwards where it would be bound, right, it's no longer in this red circle, instead wants to follow the flow of gas and would be pulled around the core's atmosphere, not allowing it to accrete. So we've checked this against some simulations, and this looks like the right sort of mass scale, right? So 
our condition for accretion by pebble accretion then becomes your Stokes number, your particle size, it needs to be large enough that your impact parameter for accretion is larger than the scale of your atmosphere, which we'll take to be the Bondi radius here. Right, so you can now use some of our models to write down what that Stokes number is analytically in sort of a very simple treatment of the impact parameter. And you get this nice simple expression here, right, where the Stokes number scales with the minima of these two quantities shown here. And in particular, notice that this minimal Stokes number is an increasing function of your core mass. So as your core gets bigger, the size of particle you can accrete gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So we thought this was interesting, we put it in our models, but then after a while, one thing we started thinking about was, well, if there is only Stokes numbers present up to some minimal maximal size in your disk, then if your core gets so big that you can't accrete particles below that maximal size, accretion will just shut off entirely. Right? So that's the thin amount here, right? So we just need to invert this expression here, which is now given as a function of, which gives the Stokes numbers a function of core mass and invert that, right? And, and what you end up with is a very simple sort of scaling that scales very nicely with the particle mass, right? You have the minimum of these two quantities, either one that scales linearly with the Stokes number or one that goes like the square root of the Stokes number. Great. So what does that look like then if I plug in some fiducial disk parameters? Right. Oh, and I should say, we've been referring to the scale as the flow isolation mass, because it's the scale at which your flow limits your growth from occurring. So what I've done here now is plotted that limiting mass scale as a function of semi-major axis for several different maximal core uh, uh, Stokes numbers, and as a function of the strength of turbulence in the disk. Right. So there's a lot of spread going on here, and there's a lot of complicated things happening, but for a wide range of Stokes numbers and alpha values, we get mass scales that are quite close to this sort of super Earth mass scale that we want, right? And that's what I've very roughly identified in blue on the left-hand side here. So you end up with scales that look very nice. All right, so now how does this scale with both the solar mass and the semi-major axis? Well, if you plug in some fiducial values, what you'll find is that of the two expressions I identified, the one on the right is the one that tends to limit growth more commonly. It's the smaller scale at most sort of reasonable values of disk parameter. And then if you go and plug in a temperature profile that's appropriate for the inner disk, where the disk is going to be heated by viscous accretion, you have a temperature profile like this. And I should note that one thing I did put in here was that I scaled the um, accretion rate here, the m dot, by the solar mass squared. It's a common observed phenomenon. What I end up with is this value scaled to fiducial parameters for my flow isolation mass, right? And I just want to throw up again this scaling for me and Chin Wu. And I just want to point out that this, right, has exactly the sort of properties we want out of this, right? We have about the right mass range going on here. We have this sort of linear scaling with the solar mass that we'd expect for such a mass scale. And we have this weak dependence on semi-major axis that we want to come out of this. So this is an idea we're very excited about. There's, this is still preliminary. There's some work to do, particularly looking at doing not just analytic expressions for the impact parameter, but being more careful with how you solve for it. But we think this has a promising candidate for what sets the sort of mass scale. So in conclusion, pebble accretion is very, very rapid, especially near super Earth mass scales. But if you assume that pebble accretion is shut off on the lower end by the scale at which your impact parameter for accretion is equal to the size of your atmosphere, you would naturally find that growth is limited at exactly the super Earth mass range. And this is now going to be dependent on your temperature profile, since it's dependent on your thermal mass. And if you put in sort of a reasonable choice for temperature profile in the inner disk, you end up with the right scaling with um, solar mass and semi-major axis. Thank you. I missed it. Can you uh, explain uh, again the f the flow uh, isolation mass? Sure, just the basic idea behind it. Yeah, the idea is that in order to be accreted, right, particles need to dissipate their kinetic energy relative to the core um, on this on this sort of length scale. But the issue is is that outside of the core, right on the scale of the core's atmosphere, the gas doesn't flow into the core anymore; it flows around it. So if you dissipate your kinetic energy around here and become down to the local gas flow, you're still too far from the core to be gravitationally bound. And so instead, you'll be pulled around by the flow of gas. Does that sort of answer your question? Is something you could get from numerical simulations? I've checked the values against numerical simulations when people actually integrate particle trajectories forward. Yeah, and so and if you look at the scale at which you don't really see accretion happening anymore, it matches up with this nicely. Yeah. 
sort of flow isolation mass, so as uh, you've alluded to it, but this must depend strongly on what the actual flow is. So here you've assumed an atmosphere of, of roughly the Bondi radius, but if, suppose this planet doesn't have an atmosphere that is much smaller than the Bondi radius, or the bound atmosphere, I mean, as, as Chris has found, you, you mentioned the recycling, you said it wouldn't change the picture, but I, ca I can't see, I mean, if you do the same calculation, but you say, well, the bound atmosphere starts at 1% of the Bondi radius, surely that will affect your results quite significantly. Sure, if it were exactly 1% of the Bondi radius, that, that might change the scale, the overall scale, but not the scaling. But it also depends on the excursion time of these flow lines into the particle's Bondi sphere as well, right? So if you have a short time scale excursion, like yes, the particle flow lines are coming in and then coming out again, you're still not gonna be able to accrete because you're coupled to the gas flow on that scale. This will depend very strongly on what structure you have for your atmosphere and how much mass you have in your atmosphere because um, I would naively expect if you have a more massive atmosphere, you can accrete larger bodies this way than if you had less mass. Sure, what it mostly depends on is that you have the mass up to a fully convective atmosphere. So you can go through sort of an order of magnitude calculation where if you have sort of the least atmospheric mass possible, right, your atmosphere is fully convective all the way down, you can still show that this is, that's enough um, gravitational energy to repel the flow of gas into that gravitationally bound atmosphere. So it just needs to be enough to repel it. And even in that very, very low atmospheric mass case, um, you're still able to repel the gas flow. How about the other end, though? Where you have a very massive atmosphere? I would just expect that actually makes it more favorable and you're more repelled, I guess. We should talk about it after. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'd be interested.